Hey everyone, I'm Rob Franick, Editor-in-Chief here at The Prince Review. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to our SAT series where we help you expand your personal knowledge of the SAT test to help you prepare to crush that test come test day. Today's segment is all about understanding classic SAT word problems. And to do just that, we're using a question from the newest edition of our SAT prep title. If you have the book handy, you can take a look at this question right along with me. It's question nine on page 327. We're going to put all this information in the description right here on YouTube. If you don't have the book, do not fret for a second. You'll see the full question right here on screen as we work through it together. Now, as I very quickly mentioned, uh, this example question is one of the all time classic SAT word problems. Hence, you'll see a ton of questions just like this. So if you master today's concept, my friends, you can use the same strategies for word problems throughout the SAT. That all said, I'm going to walk you through a couple of things. Number one, of course, how to interpret a question like this on the SAT, how to work through it, how to use the best strategies for these kinds of word problem questions on the SAT from the very beginning. Now, if you're anything like our typical students at the Princeton Review, uh, your initial temptation in a word problem is likely to just read the whole question. Start at the beginning, read through words, 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 lots of words right here on this page. Um, you might be the type of students that makes some notes or maybe you jot down some equations. But here's the thing, you really don't have to do all that much on SAT questions specifically on word problem questions. Instead, apply a good word problem basic approach. You have surely heard me or other Prince Review teachers talk about this stuff, but we're gonna refresh our memories today. Number one on the list, start with the final question. And just for extreme clarity, that means starting at the end of the question and read and underline the final question so you know exactly the question and what they are asking for. Number two, take advantage of the fact that the SAT is a multiple choice question. As such, let the answers help you near always. They'll give you really good clues about how to approach the question and how to use process of elimination to cross off incorrect answer choices. And friends, once you know what approach you're going to take, then move on to strategy number three, which is to take one little bite-sized piece at a time. Do not worry, friends, about doing it all at once. Just break it down. Do this stuff carefully. But if you do it carefully, you will always get this question right. And just to be super clear, the reason the final question really helps is that it can give you excellent clues about how to approach the question and save you for having to read and reread different parts of the question again. So, as you can see on your screen. Um, we've already underlined the final question, but you should, if you're working along with this, underline it in your book, um, just to get familiar with this process. Now, the question is asking the following, and I quote, solving which of the following systems of equations will let them know how many cups of lemonade X and how many cookies Y they sold today. Now, again, this is a pretty common question type on the SAT where the final question is asking you about an equation, a system of equation, as in this case, or an inequality or a function. But it's describing a situation. And here, of course, the answers are equations themselves that could describe the situation at hand. The fact that the answer choices have these equations means and this is so important that you don't have to recreate them on your own. That is glorious news. You also don't have to solve them because the final question is not asking you what is the value of X or how many cookies are there actually. Uh, that's not what the question is asking. And you've heard me say this before in other videos, but it's always good to say it out loud again. Don't waste your valuable time on the SAT doing work that you don't have to. Instead, when a question wants you to describe a situation or find equations or inequalities that describe a situation and they give you those equations and the answers, then start off, my friends, by translating, literally finding one bite-sized piece of information in the question and translate it. You'll use this very clear strategy to eliminate one or two or if you're incredibly lucky, three answer choices when you're going through this process and you'll keep 
moving through at one bite-sized piece at a time until you have one answer choice left. So, of course, we're going to try to get there with our question. Now, if we go back to the beginning and we start reading, we find out that Aubrey and Vera and Kia are running a lemonade and snack outfit to earn extra money. Now, friends, these three are absolutely entrepreneurs uh, to their cores, and that's awesome, but there is nothing, nothing that we can translate in that first sentence that is going to be useful to us in answering this question. There's simply no way to turn that first sentence into blissfully certain math. So we're just going to leave it alone and we're going to move it to the side and we're going to move on from there. The question then says that they're then selling lemonade for a dollar and seven cents a cup. Well, now that we could do some work with because we already know from the final question that cups of lemonade are represented by the variable X. So let's put it all together and we're going to do some translating together. If each cup is a dollar and seven cents, then put down 1.07 and X is the number of cups. That means that somewhere in the system of equations, we must have 1.07 times X. So together, let's go and look for it. Right now, I am looking at answer choice A and yeah, there it is, 1.07 X. That piece of the equation is 100% correct. Same thing with answer choice B, 1.07. 0.07x. So at least for now, we're going to leave those two answer choices alone. But then we look at answer choice C. The x has the wrong coefficient and the 1.07 is attached to the y. So that doesn't work. So C could never ever be correct. So we're going to cross it out. And friends, we're doing this because it's missing a crucial piece of one of the equations that we absolutely must have. And D is the same way because it looks pretty close, but they took out the decimal point. So instead of 1.07x, which we know is necessary, it's becoming in this question 107x, and that is most definitely incorrect. So we cross it off as well uh, as, as, as questions uh, as answer choice C. Now, Again, let's remember that by taking one little bite-sized piece of this, uh, and of course it's very appropriate that we're talking about cookies here, but be that as it may, by using this strategy, my friends, we cut out answer choices in half. We eliminated two answer choices with very little effort on our part. Now, you might have also noticed that the answer choices A and B both have 0.7y. So we know that that has to be correct, but if you wanted to, ch to check, uh, you can absolutely do that. We could go back and we find out in the passage that the cookies are 78 cents each. So cookies are represented by the variable y. So it makes perfectly good sense that 0.78y is represented. So a and b have most of the second equation right. And here again, we can use the answers to help us out. Notice that what it's equal to is changing, right? So in choice A, the correct half of the equation equals 47. And in B, it is equaling 45.94. So let's go and find information in the question uh, that will help us figure out which of these two answer choices is indeed the correct one. Now, there's clearly a 47 listed in the question. It notes that during a three hour period, they have 47 customers. But friends, we're not dealing with customers. We are dealing with money. We are dealing with how much money they made per lemonade and how much money they made per cookie. So putting 47 in the equation just doesn't make good sense. But then if you read down just a little bit further, you find out that they made $45.94. That is the money that they made. So that's what the equation should equal. If you find out how much money they made per cup of lemonade and you multiply that by the number of cups of lemonade they sold, and then you find out how much they made for the cookies, that really makes a whole lot of really good sense that they're going to equal that total amount that they made. And we know that that total amount is $45.94. 
So answer choice A gets that part wrong, which means that with conviction, we can cross off answer choice A. And answer choice B gets it right. So B, of course, is the correct answer. Feel the power in it, friends, because this is how you can work through those pesky SAT word problems. And you know what? Let us notice, for the record at least, how much we didn't do here. Let's notice how many words in this question we just didn't highlight, right? We read the first sentence together uh, just to see that if there was any work that we can do there, uh, but it turned out to be completely irrelevant. And this, my friends, is what the folks at the College Board, the creators of all things SAT do. They're putting lots and lots of unnecessary information into word problems just to make it sound like a story. And to be honest, not a very compelling story, but be that as it may, what they're doing uh, is trying to confuse you, right? Is trying to make you waste your time. And as you know, there is very little time to waste on the SAT. But by working in these bite-sized pieces and starting with the final question, you don't waste that time. You recognize from the get-go that the sentence, and I'll quote, the customer is arriving on foot or by car. Who cares? Maybe they also thought about taking the bus that day. Again, who cares? It has nothing to do with the system of equations. The answer also notes a three-hour period. That's, again, useless to you. It has nothing to do with the system of equations. The answer also uh, notes that they need to figure out how many supplies they need for tomorrow. Again, my friends, this has nothing to do with the system of equations. So suffice it to say uh, that there's lots of unnecessary and hence useless information in an SAT word problem. So again, if we work in bite-sized pieces, find the information that we need, use the process of elimination, you're always going to get this type of question right, which is, of course, our unapologetic goal. But if you use this method that we're walking through today, you'll also get that right answer quickly. So you'll have both speed and efficiency on your side. And that, my friends, packs a very positive wallop come test day. And it's all because you didn't do any unnecessary work or spent unnecessary time on a particular question. So that's it, folks. We should keep in mind our word problem basic approach now and forevermore on the SAT. And we should also remember that the SAT is a different kind of test, more different than you would ever notice in your uh, typical high school math class. So using a different approach to solving these problems is also necessary. And to recap what that approach is, number one, you're using the final question. Number two, you're using the answer choices. Number three, you're identifying the strategy that you're going to use, and then you're gonna walk through that in bite-sized pieces. Friends, as always, I'm hoping that this was fun for you. I'm hoping that this question uh, helped you out as well. Please know that our full team here at the Prince Review wish you the best of luck in your SAT prep. And please do remember to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already for the latest information on careers and colleges and test prep and a whole lot more. Rob Franick, Editor-in-Chief here at the Prince Review, signing off for today.